I think any serious person who opens their eyes today understands that climate change is happening, it's accelerating, and it threatens the very basis of human civilization. At the same time, we're also experiencing a global epidemic of obesity and type 2 diabetes. And we know that diabetes is just a sentinel disease that predicts many future downstream adverse effects. At the same time, by 2050, we'll be adding about 2 billion people to our planet's population. And that adds to the challenges that we're facing. We clearly understand that the most important thing to limit climate change is to reduce fossil fuel consumption and really eliminate it. But our food system is contributing about 30% of the greenhouse gas emissions that are fueling climate change. So if we don't do something about our food system, even if we eliminate fossil fuels, we will still not be able to control climate change and stay within 2 degrees centigrade warming. And our food system, of course, has a lot to do with the epidemic of obesity and diabetes that we're experiencing. I was privileged to co-chair an international commission, the Eat Lancet Commission, that was charged with finding a pathway to feeding the world's population by 2050 a diet that is both healthy and sustainable. That brought together 35 scientists from 17 different countries. And we did, in the end, conclude that it was possible, barely so, and I'm going to take you a bit behind the curtains to describe some of the evidence to see how we got there. We first concentrated on defining a healthy diet. Everybody agrees we should eat in a healthy diet, but when you come down to, to defining it, I'm sure you're aware there are plenty of controversies out there. So there were four layers of evidence that we used. First, the composition of food, uh, the effects of different foods on risk factors for heart disease, like blood pressure, uh, serum cholesterol levels, associations of diets and dietary factors with disease outcomes in large epidemiologic studies, and then where we had it, but we had limited data from randomized trials looking at different aspects of diet and prevention of disease. I'm going to here use it as an example uh, studies of different types of protein in the diet, different sources of protein in the diet, because that has very major impacts on both climate change and health. So here is a figure looking at the ratio of polyunsaturated to saturated fat in various foods. And we've known for more than 60 years that a good PS ratio will reduce blood cholesterol levels, a major risk factor for heart disease. And Foods very greatly. If we look at milk, beef, pork, basically animal foods, those have very low PS ratios. Chicken, salmon are sort of intermediate, but if we really want to go to good ratios of polyunsaturate to saturated fat, we need to go to plant protein sources like nuts, tofu, and other soy products, or lentils. These differences are huge, and they would predict that we would prefer those plant protein sources for moderating our blood cholesterol levels. Fortunately, there are a handful of studies that looked at that very directly. These are randomized studies and are important for causal interpretation. And we could see in those studies, if we switch from nuts or other healthy plant protein sources to red meat, LDL, the bad cholesterol, goes up. And that, of course, would predict higher risk of cardiovascular disease. But a number is a number, and we're really looking at disease, not just a number for our blood cholesterol levels. And so to look at disease outcomes, our research group has set up a series of long-term prospective epidemiologic studies. The first was a nurse's health study beginning our dietary collection back in 1980. And what's unique about these studies is that we've tracked individuals, this is over 121,000 registered nurses for decades now, uh, every two years or four years, updating our information about what they're eating, uh, other risk factors, other behaviors, and then tracking incidents of virtually every major disease, cancers, cardiovascular diseases, and now dementia. We added 52,000 men in 1986, and in 1989, another 116,000 registered nurses. And these studies, of course, could not have happened without the imp incredible participation of each member of these cohorts. So after about 30 years, 
Uh, we looked at the data, about a bit over 30,000 participants had died by that time. And so we could look carefully at the different sources of protein that people were consuming. Uh, by far the lowest mortality was with the plant sources of protein. Poultry, fish, dairy food proteins were related about to average mortality. And the highest mortality was with people who emphasized red meat, both unprocessed and processed meat in their diet. So here we had three layers of evidence that showed very clearly and consistently that we would be better off with our diets represented more by plant sources of protein than animal sources of protein, particularly red meat. So how much red meat might be compatible with a healthy diet? Well, you might say it was zero. It's really a straight line relationship between red meat consumption and risk of diabetes and cardiovascular disease. But we did see that if we had about one modest serving a week, maybe one hamburger a week, the risk would be pretty low. So if someone really likes red meat, you don't have to totally give it up, but you could still have a pretty low risk uh, with just about one serving per week. And especially if you replace that red meat with a healthy plant source of protein like nuts, legumes, or soy products. So we went through food group by food group, looking at these layers of evidence, and what we ended up was with something pretty simple, one plus one. Most people can get that. Uh, and that's about one serving of dairy a day at most. You could also have none if you preferred, and about one serving of other animal source protein per day, with red meat being about once a week, fish, poultry, or eggs on, an, on other days of the week. Of course, that's on a base of whole grains, plenty of fruits and vegetables, and uh, relatively uh, small amounts of sugar and sugar-sweetened beverages. Uh, interestingly, that description that I just gave you fits very well with the traditional Mediterranean diet, which has been studied in great detail for decades now, and it's very well documented that this is a very healthy diet. And by the way, it's also a delicious and variable diet that people can really enjoy. And that's important because if you prescribe a diet uh, that people can't stay with for the long run, it's not going to be successful. But uh, in this situation, uh, for the Mediterranean diet, we actually did have a randomized trial that was conducted in Spain by our uh, colleagues there. And this compared a control, low-fat diet with a Mediterranean diet that had either more nuts or another version of the Mediterranean diet with some extra virgin olive oil. And the trial actually had to be stopped after about five years because there was a highly significant difference with favoring lower, about a 30% lower risk of cardiovascular disease with those randomly assigned to the Mediterranean diet. And the difference was so large, it was considered unethical to continue the study any further. We also went back to our large cohort studies, and we could actually score the diet of every individual in our cohort according to their uh, consistency with a Mediterranean or what we call a planetary health diet, and follow those individuals over time. And after uh, over 30 years, we could see that the participants in our large cohort studies who most closely adhered to this planetary health diet had about a 30% lower mortality than those who were, had the lowest scores, who were least following that healthy dietary pattern. This is women, and we saw virtually the same result for men. And what's important here, it's not all or nothing. Each step of the way toward a healthier, more sustainable diet uh, was related to lower risk. We could also see how to put this kind of dietary pattern together with flavors from around the world. For example, this is a traditional Vietnamese diet with uh, here tofu providing a major source of protein. This is a healthy, sustainable diet from Costa Rica where beans are a central part of the protein traditionally and maize provides a major part of the calories in the diet. The good news is we could reassemble that diet from many different flavors and many different eating cultures. We then went on to look at our cohorts again to see how adherence to this planetary health diet was associated with environmental outcomes. And we could see that those in the 20% most adherent to a planetary health diet had about a 29% lower greenhouse gas emissions from their diets compared to people in the lowest 20% of their adherents. 
Also, and perhaps most importantly, we could see that cropland use was about 51% lower with better adherence to a planetary health diet. And that's really important because that means we can basically let a lot of our land go back to forest and not only be healthier uh, because of having better diets, but also greatly lessen our uh, uh, environmental impact and open up the space for a regenerative kind of agriculture or use of forests. Now, this isn't going to happen just by policymakers in Washington making the right decisions. Yeah, but this is really going to require the efforts of everybody. That means shifting our own diets. There's something we can do about this at our home. But that's not enough. We have to be change makers as well. So no matter where we are, if we are a teacher or involved in education, we can make sure our students understand this information about healthy, sustainable eating, and that we practice it in our institutions where we're feeding kids. In our healthcare system, we need to start emphasizing nutrition because there'll be huge benefits for health and also, of course, the planet at the same time. And again, people in that system need to be change makers and change what's being served for our patients, uh, for our employees, and everybody who enters the doors. So feeding 10 billion people a healthy diet within safe planetary boundaries is possible, and it will improve the health and well-being of billions of people this would allow us to pass on to our children and our grandchildren a viable planet.